last week, as Summer mentioned, for Football Sunday, because it was just a bunch of Christians doing Christian things, like having hot dogs at 8.30 and 10 in the morning, you know? <laughs> Sometimes you just got to take a break and have some hot dogs a little early at church on a Sunday. It was a great week, uh, but we're in a big series. It's, we're going through the book of Matthew. That's the study right now, and so we took a break from that, but we're getting right back to it today. So we just got to kind of catch up. So two weeks ago, just to refresh our memory, Mike was here, and he had an awesome message on Matthew chapter 3 verses 7 to 12, and the theme was the king's requirement. Now, if you'll remember, or maybe you weren't here, let me just tell you what it was about. It was about a baptism, actually, which is fitting for today. And it was a baptism of repentance that John the Baptist was doing in, those chapter, in that chapter in those verses. And so Mike had this awesome message. If you missed it last two weeks ago, I encourage you to check it out. You can check us out on YouTube. We've got a YouTube channel, or you can go right to our website, forward slash sermons, and you'll find it there. So catch up on that if you would. But that brings us to this week. We're still in chapter three, actually, and we're going to finish chapter three together today. And we're looking at verses 13 to 17, and the, key, the theme for us is the king's coronation. The king's coronation. Now, if you aren't familiar with that word coronation, a coronation is really just a ceremony where a sovereign is crowned, usually. That is, a sovereign's like a king or a queen, somebody like that, a ruler. And a coronation is that ceremony where they're crowned and then they can kind of commence their work as a sovereign, as a king or a queen. I kind of have to say that to you because we're Americans. And Americans, we're just not as familiar with kings and queens. It's just not the way we do things around here. We're not familiar with that, but you know what we are familiar with as Americans? Fast food. Yeah, we're better at that. Fast food and marketing. So there's a king that I want to talk to you about, and guess who that king is? Yeah, that's right. It's Burger King. I'll talk to you about Burger King. Burger King doesn't seem as popular these days, but you still probably remember that they'd hand out these crowns. Take a look at the screen. Now, I actually tried to get one of these crowns at a drive through this week. And uh, with the length of awkward silence that we had after I asked a grown woman from a grown man if I could have one of those crowns, we could probably fit my whole sermon in the awkward silence that ensued. And finally, the lady just said to me, yeah, we don't have those. <laughs> So I preached this message already at 8.30, and I just want you to know that somebody found a Burger King crown at home, and they brought me one today for second service. Shout out to Brian Cowett in first service online. He came in his pajamas, and he dropped this off to me. I'm not going to lie. Dude, I like those pajama bottoms, Brian, if you're still online listening to this. Thank you for that. So there's our Burger King crown. Now, if you're like me, and you're a kid in the 80s, you would make sure you got one of these bad boys if you went to Burger King, right? I mean, it was all about the crown. You do your little origami and you fold that thing and you get it set to your head size. And then for you, man, you could be king or queen for a day. And so, you know, you'd be eating your little happy meal and you get a little ketchup on your fingers. You fold that thing and you just put it in your hair. You got ketchup in your hair. Now, you don't care. You just, you just puff your chest out. And I'm ready to king or queen it right now. King of the, the burger and fries, as far as I'm concerned. Because as a kid, it was really exciting to be crowned. Remember, a coronation is a ceremony where a sovereign is often crowned. And Burger King didn't miss this concept. And their marketing actually was pretty genius. In fact, many of you remember their slogan. Let me just remind you, in case you weren't a kid of the 80s and 90s like me, and you don't know, their slogan was this, have it your way. Let me give you a little crown, a little sovereign, boy or girl, and why don't you just have it your way today? Just have it your way. Have your Happy Meal just the way you like it. You don't like pickles? Don't have them. Have it your way today. <laughs> they taught us young right there with our kids' meal. Here's your crown. You can be the king. You can be the queen. <laughs> and you thought you were just getting an unhealthy lunch. That's what you thought. <laughs> but it was more than that. You see, we were going through a coronation of sorts. Just one more example in your American culture of you being crowned king or queen of your own life. That's how it works. I bet you never heard a pastor say this, but I want you to keep Burger King in mind today as we jump into Matthew chapter three. <laughs> because it's also about a coronation. Now, just to be clear, there is no crown in the coronation I'm about to read you. This crown, there's no crown in this one. But nonetheless, I think it will fly right into the face of some of our most precious Happy Meal moments. And why will it mess with our have it your way mentality, you might ask? Well, in Matthew 3, it becomes crystal clear that there's a new sovereign in town. You see, there's a new king 
showing up on the scene. And his name is Jesus. He's made his way out to the Jordan River, where we've been learning, if you've been tracking with us here at New Day, that John the Baptist is at the Jordan River. And he's doing this very innovative practice. He's now immersing people in water, as you saw done today in first and second service. And we have more for third. Immersing people in water. For the Jews especially, this is completely new. And he's asking people to repent of their sin. You've been living life in a way that is not God's best. It's not what God has planned for you. You have not been doing what he asked. So come out and repent and be immersed. Be water baptized and agree to live a new way when you come out of those waters. While he's doing all of this, he mentions that somebody's coming. It's not him. It's not John the Baptist. Somebody much greater than him is on the way. Yeah, a sovereign. One of those king types is coming, and that is who John is preparing the way for. I think that sets the stage for us, and now we can read chapter 3, verses 13 to 17 together. You can use your own Bible or take a look at the screen. And here's what the scripture says. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John. That's John the Baptist. To be baptized by him. That is, Jesus wants to be baptized by John the Baptist. John would have prevented him, saying, wait a minute, I need to be baptized by you, Jesus, and you come to me? That's the way you got to read that. But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented, that is Jesus consented, I'm sorry, John consented to Jesus. And when Jesus was baptized by John, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, it's the very voice of God, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Amen. You see, this ceremony is missing a crown. And we'll get to that toward the end of the message. But first, I want to spend some time together focusing on some details of this coronation that you just can't miss. So if you're with me and you'd like to take notes, whether you're online or here in person, I hope you will, because I think there's some things that you and I, we can't afford to miss today when it comes to the details of the king's coronation. And here's number one. Number one is this, John's humility. As we read those verses together, I don't want you to miss John's humility. Some of you have heard this already, but you have to remember that John the Baptist, he's a prophet that shows up after 400 years of prophetic silence. That is, there hasn't been legitimate prophetic word of the Lord in 400 years. You and I, we've been thinking about the coronavirus, and so we've been talking about the Spanish flu, which was about 100 years ago, trying to predict, like, when's the coronavirus COVID thing going to stop? That feels like ages ago, and that was just 100 years ago. Think 100 times four, and now you've got the scene for what's been happening in God's people, and thinking, man, when's this prophet going to show up? And the Bible says that John is that prophet. He's the prophet showing up after 400 years. You see, Malachi is the last prophet 400 years prior. It's also the book right before Matthew. And you'll see that Malachi says that something had to happen before that prophet would show up. And so take a look at Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. Before, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Malachi says there's going to be this prophet that shows up. He doesn't give a timeline, but he says, before the great day of the Lord, that is before the Messiah is coming on the scene, there's got to be a prophet that shows up. Malachi says that before the Messiah is to come, Elijah is that prophet. Now, you have to know this. If you're new to the Bible, and maybe some of you are, and by the way, maybe you're here for the first time because you came to watch someone get baptized. I just want you to know that's so cool that you would show up and do that. It means the world to them, and I'm so glad you're here. Let me just inform you that Elijah was a famous Old Testament prophet. And so Malachi is saying, Elijah comes before the Messiah comes, but we find out that this turns out to be much more figurative. And we know that because of Jesus. Let me show you what Jesus says. He plainly tells us in Matthew, a little bit later, chapter 11, verse 14, and if you're willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. Who's the he that Jesus is talking about? None other than John the Baptist. 
So if you're tracking with me right now, after 400 years of silence, John the Baptist gets to be the man. He gets to be that prophet. And then Jesus confirms, not only is he a prophet that just shows up after 400 years of silence, that's a big deal all of its own, but John is actually the Elijah that Malachi has promised must come before the Messiah begins, the earthly ministry. So if you're tracking with me, that's a big deal. It's enough to give most people a big head. The ego has been stroked, I promise you, for John the Baptist in those days. But just in case you weren't sure that John the Baptist was kind of a big deal, I want to tell you something else that Jesus said about him. Right before he called him that Elijah, take a look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 11. Jesus is saying this about John the Baptist. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. I'm getting hungry again, but I feel like if any person that could fulfill the have it your way mentality, it's got to be John the Baptist. He's the man. He's got it all going on. He might as well be John the Burger King. That's how I feel about it. <laughs> He's a special dude. He's got that swag swag, if you know what I mean. Like he, This guy is something else. I went through all of that with you just so you can't miss one little detail. I don't want you to miss John's reluctance to baptize Jesus. Amidst all of that being true about him, he's reluctant to baptize him. Because it's that kind of humility that so many of us lack if we were being honest. Yet nobody has said of you or me the kind of things that were said of John the Baptist. Take a look again so you don't miss it. Matthew chapter 3, verse 14. John would have prevented him. No way, Jesus. I'm not baptizing you. Saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me? John's saying something like this along the lines of, I'm a great man, I know, as truly great as I might be, and as great a role as I know I've been given as a prophet, here's what John knows. I'm still a sinner. I'm still fully man and only man. John says, I need repentance. As much as I might sacrifice and strive, I'm never going to be the sinless Messiah King. And John the Baptist knows, I'm looking him dead in the eye. The sinless one, the spotless one, that's who I'm looking at. How could I baptize him? He's got to baptize me. He's saying what many of us never say. He's saying, I can't have it my way. Jesus is king. Jesus is Lord. John knew he was the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He knew that of Jesus, and we see him say it in John chapter 1, verse 29. And John knew that a sinful man like himself had no business baptizing the Messiah. I know it's 2022, and this might be hard, but I just want you to ponder something with me for a minute, if you'll, you'll humor me. I just want to ask this question rhetorically to you. Would you have responded the same way as John the Baptist? Do you have the kind of humility that the famous John the Baptist had? My question for you today is this. What image do you have of yourself? When you spend time thinking about yourself, and I know you're saying, oh, Andrew, I don't think about myself. I'm too holy to think about myself. All right, well, guess what? I think about myself a lot. So let me just tell you, I'll just be honest with you. I think about myself sometimes. When you think about yourself, let's get over that hump. When you think about yourself, because you know you spend a little time thinking about yourself. And when you weigh all those things that are true about you, and you start to think about your accomplishments and your accolades, your resume, your possessions, and you start to consider your own life, can I just ask you this question? Do you ever take the next step to compare all of those things to the reality of King Jesus? Do you ever take the time to look at all of those things in light of King Jesus and the reality of his kingdom? If you don't, I think this might help. Right after Jesus says that among those born of women, there's no one greater than John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 11, I want you to see what he reminds us of in Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, 
Take a look. Jesus says, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. <laughs> Jesus is just a wonderful compliment of John the Baptist, but then he just kind of sets it right. It's this amazing paradigm shift. It's this godly perspective. In fact, it's truth. And Jesus wants to deliver truth in that moment. He says, as amazing as he is, and he's amazing, John the Baptist. And some of you here at New Day are too. Some of you are doing wonderful things. Some of you out there online. But Jesus says, no matter how great, even if you could surpass John the Baptist great, they're always the least in the kingdom of heaven. Ah, the, the kingdom of heaven, the least of those above John the Baptist. Jesus is saying, you're looking for something that's true? Well, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And if you're looking to your own kingdom to find truth, it's going to always come up short. You're not going to find it. Your way, have it your way, you can do that. But that's never where you'll find truth because no matter how good you get, how great you do, how much you accomplish in the kingdom of heaven, when it really matters, when the rubber meets the road, no matter how high you can climb, let's say you could get beyond John the Baptist. Jesus says, don't forget the kingdom of heaven because it always supersedes anything of this earth. You see, 2,000 years later, if you have spiritual eyes to see it, I don't want you to miss John the Baptist and his humility because ultimately today what I want you to do is I want you to consider your own. You see, there's a greater kingdom than your own. Maybe I'm the first person to ever tell you that. But I want to tell you the truth today. It's my job. And I promise you there's a greater truth than what you've been seeing. And there's a greater kingdom than what you've been building. And that kingdom deserves our attention and it de deserves our submission. And John's humility shows us the way. That's detail number one. If you're still with me and taking notes, here's detail number two that we can't miss. Number one is John's humility. Here's number two. It's Jesus' baptism. Jesus' baptism. If Jesus had asked me to baptize him, I'm, I'm going to be honest, I'd have jumped right in that water. <laughs> no hesitation whatsoever. I'd back out, get out of the way. Jesus just asked me to get in. I'm in. <laughs> Drew's going to take care of JC right now. Everybody just get out the way. That's how I would have done it. I'm just going to be straight with you. That's why none of us have to worry if Jesus is going to show up and ask me to do some kind of extra baptism for him. It's not going to happen. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Take a deep breath. I don't have that kind of humility. But John, John was different. John was different. Take a look again at how this exchange happens. But Jesus answered him. John, John, John wants to prevent it. Jesus answers him. Let it be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And look at these words. Then he, John, consented. John says, okay. Tried to resist Jesus. Feels wrong. You're sinless. This is a baptism of repentance. But then he consents. John humbly obeys, trusting that Jesus has to know best. What a wonderful example for you and for me. And now what we find ourselves with is the first recorded words of Jesus, apart from when he said, do you not know that I had to be in my father's house when he's talking to his parents as a young boy? back in Luke chapter 2, verse 49. Jesus says this in these, these first recorded words since that moment. Let it be so now, for thus it's fitting to fulfill all righteousness. This let it be so now, it's an, in, an idiom, meaning that the act of his baptism, though not seemingly appropriate, was indeed appropriate for just this special time. That is, Jesus is admitting, you're right, I am sinless. It's true, I am the Lamb of God. And this wouldn't make sense normally. I understand, John, but you just got to trust me. Let it be so now. In this little moment, I promise you, there's a special exclusion here. You, you just got to trust me right now, John. I'm doing something special. And John does. There are many reasons for Jesus being baptized and specifically by John. And he says, God's plan has to be perfectly fulfilled in this special time. 
But what I want to focus on is one of the most important ones today. You see, Jesus got baptized because he came into the world to identify with men and women. Jesus came into the world to be Emmanuel, God with us. He came into the world to identify with you and to identify with me and not just with us. This is what's so powerful. He came to identify with men and to identify with men is to identify with sin. He could not purchase righteousness for mankind if he did not identify with mankind's sin. It's precisely what he came to do. And just in case you aren't sure that you can believe that statement, hundreds of years before Christ's coming, I want to show you what the prophet Isaiah had declared about the Messiah that was to come. Take a look at Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12. Because he poured out his soul to death, and look at this, he was numbered with the transgressors. Did you ever hear of Jesus that he was a friend of sinners? Love that. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors, the sinners, people just like you and just like me. Jesus' baptism represented the willing identification of the sinless Son of God with the sinful people that he came to save. I just got to say something to somebody here today. If you thought you were too far gone for Jesus... If you've ever had that lie creep in, that you don't know, Andrew, if I showed you what's in my closet, there's no way Jesus could love somebody like me. Andrew, you don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've done. In fact, nobody knows but me, Andrew. So there's no way Jesus could love me. I know it's nice and flowery and fluffy to say as a pastor, but you got it wrong, man, because I won't let a soul know what I've done, because I know God could never love me. If that's your thinking, I just need to remind you of something right from the scripture today that we see. The Bible says that Jesus longed to be numbered with you. Before you ever did anything good for him, and by the way, no matter what you could conjure that you think is good would never be good enough. Before you ever acknowledged him, he longed to be numbered with you. This is a detail that you can see right in Matthew chapter 3, watching Jesus be baptized. Right there in your sin, right there in your repentance ceremony that you need as a sinner, Jesus is ready to jump in the waters with you. That was the first act of his ministry, the first step in the redemptive plan that he came to fulfill he who had no sin took his place among those who had no righteousness. He who was without sin submitted to a baptism for sinners. In this act, the Savior of the world took his place among the sinners of the world. Don't miss it today. Your Savior longed to identify with you. This is why I just want to pause and say how proud I am of all of you who just went public with your faith in water baptism. When you go into those waters of baptism, you're saying, I'm with Jesus. I'm with him now. I've had it my way enough. I long to be numbered with Jesus. I long to be numbered with him enough to get up here in a t-shirt and stand in front of all of you. You think that's not hard to do? Ask him. I know you're a bunch of Christians. It's still scary to get up here. And there's a ton of people online. I shouldn't even say it out loud. That's probably going to freak someone out. It's true. <laughs> it wasn't easy, but they said, I got to identify with him. I got to let the world know that I'm with Jesus now. It's just different for me. And how fitting. Because we see in Matthew chapter 3 that Jesus longed to be numbered with you. He was willing to get into sinful baptism waters in order to identify those very people, identify with those very people that he had come to save. What a model Jesus was and what a great example that you did today to get water baptized. You see, this wasn't John's plan. John would have had it set that Jesus baptized him. But there's always a greater work that God can accomplish when we are willing to consent to his way above our own. John was a wonderful man Something felt wrong to him, but Jesus himself said, no, you got to do this, and John consented. 
And by consenting, we have this powerful moment of the Savior of the world, the sinless Lamb of God, getting in those repentant waters to identify with you and me. I'm so thankful, in hindsight, for John's obedience, for John's humility. I'm so thankful for the rich theological truth that emanates from that moment in Matthew chapter 3, the very end of the chapter. There's only one way to be righteous, and it's not a baptism that's going to cure you. Baptism doesn't save you. Jesus saves you. He's the one. And he gets in those waters and says, I'll identify with you if you will accept what I'm going to do for your sins. He wanted to find you at your lowest point. He wanted to take on every one, last one of your sins, even the ones you'd be embarrassed to tell me or a closest friend about. This baptism, we know Jesus was identifying with you at your worst. This is Jesus' baptism, and it's beautiful. John's humility led us there. His consent to the sinless king allows Jesus to baptize be baptized into our transgressions and our iniquities. That's the second detail. If you're still with me, I want you to see the third and final detail today. We saw John's humility. We see the power of Jesus identifying with you and me in our sin. And finally, number three, we have Jesus' coronation. Jesus' coronation. Let's just read this moment together from the pages of Scripture. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven, this is the voice of God, says, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. I was looking closely during the baptisms today. I didn't see any doves. I was waiting for it. Some of you look really holy up here, but I didn't see a single dove land on anyone. And there's a reason, because Jesus and his baptism was unique. It was supposed to be. Remember when he said, let it be so now? This is unique. This is a one-off. It's a special, holy moment. You see, when he became a man, Jesus did not lose his divinity. He was still fully God in every way. In his deity, he needed nothing. But in his humanity... He was here now being anointed for service and granted strength for ministry. The Spirit anointed him for his kingly service. And Isaiah, the prophet, predicted this. Take a look. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedoms to the prisoners. Do you see Jesus coming to identify with you? And now we have the Spirit of God falling on him, fulfilling that prophecy from Isaiah. Jesus being anointed by the Holy Spirit, it was unique. It's now a confirming sign to John the Baptist. I I gotta imagine he's shocked in this moment. He can't even believe he's actually baptizing Jesus. And now as he stands there in this moment, knowing he is just man, knowing all the way that he falls short, like you and I know so well about our own lives. And now the Spirit of God falls and a voice from heaven. It was done for John so he knows that Jesus for sure, without a shadow of a doubt, is the Messiah. And for all of those people as witnesses that would have seen. Notice the entire Trinity is present. They participate. Jesus himself, the Holy Spirit, and the voice of God. It's a miraculous, special moment. But you still have to ask yourself this question if you've been tracking with me. And the question is this, where's the crown? Andrew, you're calling this a coronation, but I don't see the crown. Isn't there supposed to be a crowning at a coronation? We've studied this in depth that new day. In fact, Mike preached a message in December that Jesus will receive a royal crown at his second coming. Michael, I think, mentioned this even in next week's message. But before that second coming crown, Jesus did receive a crown. You'll find it in the pages of Matthew and all the other Gospels. There will be a crown, and there was a crown, and it was the crown of thorns. I don't want you to miss this very important detail of all of this baptism coronation moment. You see, Jesus is absolutely foreshadowing in that moment 
his death, and then his ultimate resurrection from the dead. Not only did he join you in your sin in a baptism of repentance, but he's foreshadowing his own death on a cross with a crown of thorns, causing blood to drip down his face and all over his body, and then a resurrection to defeat death, to defeat sin, so that you and I can finally have a way to a sinless God because our, our righteousness, our works, the things we thought were good on our resume were never going to get us there. So he said, I'll make a way. And the way includes that crown of thorns on the way to Calvary. See, Hebrews tells us it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Those Old Testament methods in an effort to clean people up. But in 1 Peter 1.19, the crown of thorns would create precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. You see, Jesus bled and he died for you in your place for your sins. And his baptism and his coronation are pointing to it. It's screaming it actually for those that have the ears to hear. As we close our time together today, I just want to remind you that Chick-fil-A is closed on Sundays. <laughs> Thought you should know. But guess who's open? Burger King. Burger King. It's true. Burger King's open. And maybe you'll have better luck than I did and they'll give you a crown. Or maybe now I'll let you borrow mine that Brian gave me. Along with a Happy Meal, they're going to feed you a diet rich in sugar and sodium. And then they're going, to remind this, they're going to remind you of this. If you go to Burger King today, they're going to say this to you. Have it your way. Have it your way. And I think you're smart enough to know that Burger King isn't the only organization that will feed you those things. Why don't you be the sovereign of your life? Why don't you do what you want to do? Why don't you be you? You do you. Why don't you do what makes you happy? These are the phrases of our culture. This is what it means to have it your way. This is what you've been fed, sometimes along with a meal. Have it your way. My question for you is this. When they give it to you in that message and they give you a nice little paper crown, you toss that on and you start ruling your kingdom. Here's my question for you. Will your little paper crown be good enough to take you through this life and the life to come. All on your own. At the end of the day, what you and I have to offer in humanness, in this fleshly form, it's just a paper crown. I know a bunch of you are better than me. I know a bunch of you are killing it. I know a bunch of you, you got unbelievable resumes, and all I'm here to tell you is that I think that's great, and I'm so glad, I hope you're achieving, and I think it's wonderful, and I'm sure you're doing a better job than me. But I do know the truth. And the truth says that even if you can beat John the Baptist, Jesus says that in the kingdom of God, the least in the kingdom of God is always going to be greater than anything earthly you can bring. Amen. Whatever you bring to the table, if you think it's going to be your salvation ticket, it's always just a paper crown. It'll be burned up. It'll be trampled on. It's never enough. So my final question for you today is this. Who are you going to crown? Are you going to have it your way? Are you going to crown yourself king? Or can we spin the message a little bit? Instead of having it your way, could you have it Yahweh? <laughs> I straight up stole that from somebody. I didn't have that in first service. My mom texted me. She goes, you should have said Yahweh. Someone else put it in the chat. I think it's amazing. It's gold. I got to use it. Are you going to have it your way or are you going to have it Yahweh? In case you're new to church, Yahweh, the Hebrew name for God. Which way are you going to have it? Are you going to keep crowning yourself king of your life? Or will it finally be his way? Will you finally submit to the reality? It's the truth anyhow. Here's what I know. People are pursuing truth. They want to know what's true. You might not even be a believer here today, but it still will be true of you. Your way will fall short. I didn't have to tell you that. You didn't need a preacher to explain that reality because you felt it already. It's either your way or Yahweh. The choice is always up to you. 
So if you're ready today to steal the Burger King slogan with me and spit it and spin it, something in your heart you might say today is, I don't want to have it your way anymore. I want to have it Yahweh. I take off the earthly paper crown and I crown you, Jesus, rightful king of my life on the throne. King of all the universe. It's just true. But especially today, this coronation ceremony of sorts for myself, Jesus, I crown you king of my life. If you'd like to do that today, I want to encourage you to join me in prayer. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It's so powerful. If we're willing to look at the details, God, you have so much to show us. God, I thank you for John's humility. Lord, so many of us, we're not humble at all like him, yet we could never even measure up to him as a man. So God, I pray that his humility would be a guiding light for some of us today that need to chop ourselves down a couple notches. Lord, nothing wrong with achieving, God. You've called us to, to run the race for the prize, but God, remind us today, God, just take us down a couple notches. It's all just a paper crown if it's not part of your kingdom. So God, would you just help us see John's humility? God, in your baptism, would you remind someone here today that you longed to be numbered with them? God, before they did anything for you, you longed to be numbered with them as a sinner. You, without sin, came to be numbered with those that had no righteousness to offer. God, remind us of our first love. It's Jesus who was so willing to be Emmanuel, God, with us in our darkest, nastiest places. And God, I thank you for your beautiful, miraculous coronation ceremony. No crown, but we see the Trinity. God, we know there's a crown for you to come. It's that crown of thorns that you willingly placed on your head as you were placed on a cross. So God, I thank you for that death. And I pray that if someone has not accepted it, being the death that was done in their place, they belonged on that cross, yet you said you'll take their sin. You loved them that much that you didn't want to see death for them. You'd face it yourself. God, I pray that they would see today with spiritual eyes that they don't have to take that death anymore. They can allow you to take it in their place. God, if they were honest, they'd tell you they've been having it their way. God, today I pray that they would make it Yahweh, that you would be God, that you would be Lord, that you would be Christ the King. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for experiencing this message with us. If you've been blessed by what you heard, you can give a one-time or reoccurring gift at newdaychurch.cc forward slash giving or text any amount on your smartphone right now to 84321. We would love to connect with you even more, so be sure to like us on Facebook or follow us on Instagram. And don't forget to find us on the Church Center app for more information about all things New Day. May God bless you, and we hope to see you again soon.